Again, thanks for having me, everybody listening. Uh, thanks for bearing with me for 30 minutes while I ramble about something I uh, think is very cool. So my name is Rolf van der Gint. I have been a software engineer at Capgemini since 2017. And in my free time, I enjoy gaming on my gaming console, fiddling around with code and systems, uh, playing with my kids, and hopefully, if Corona permits it, maybe picking up some sports again in September. Okay, so what I wanna to talk to you about today is how can you get new developers and your teams up and running in no time? I would say less than an hour. Uh, and how to keep your team's development environments in sync. So how to keep everybody using the same tools. Uh, we'll see, we'll check out a couple of uh, subjects. That's what Visual Studio Code can do for us out of the box to help us use the same tool set. How container con uh, technology can help us get up and running really fast. Uh, how we com can combine those two to create one little package and just give it to our developers so they can start working. And how we can uh, move some of the heavy lifting and processing to the cloud from our local dev machine. So my question for you is, have you ever spent more than a day setting up your dev machine for a new project? Have you ever spent time reconfiguring your machine when switching between code bases or projects? Have you ever spent time finding out why stuff that was working yesterday or last week suddenly doesn't work anymore? Or have you ever encountered configuration drift between team members? Uh, by that I mean team member A checks in some code, it's formatted in, a, in a one way, and team member B checks in some code, it's formatted in a completely different way. You want to resolve those issues, or I want to resolve those issues. So there are some options we can uh, uh, check out. Uh, and I want to show you in this talk. Uh, first, uh, there's recommended extensions in Visual Studio Code, which helps you use the same tool set for all your developers. Then there's containers for getting up and running fast, moving that into dev containers, combining the two, and then moving that to Visual Studio Code spaces to offload to the cloud. There are some requirements uh, to be able to do this, what I'm going to show you. One is you have to have Visual Studio Code installed, which is a, a code editor. It's free, and you can download it at code.visualstudio.com and you need to install one extension, which is the remote development extension. I'll show you that in a bit. Uh, also, you need Docker Desktop installed, which is a free version of Docker where you can run containers on your local development machine. And if you have Windows Subsystem for Linux version two installed, you can even run the back end of that in there. So you get a nice performance boost. Now I've created a simple little uh, demo application to show you um, that it actually works. Uh, which is an ASP.NET Core web API backend with an Angular front end, and that uh, retrieves some data from a MongoDB database and caches it in a Redis cache. So the flow is the application calls the cache. If the information is not there, it goes to the database, puts it in the cache, and then gives it back to the application. And for the next call, it just gets it from cache. Oh, let me go back one slide. So first off, let's look at re uh, Sorry, recommended extensions in Visual Studio Code. Uh, no, first off, let me show you the one extension I have installed before this demo. So I installed the remote development extension, which is really easy to find. You just go to your uh, extensions tab in Visual Studio Code, and you say uh, remote development. It will find it for you, and you can click the install button, which for me now is the uninstall button. Now going back to my installed extensions. Remote development extension is actually an extension pack which installs WSL remote, which means uh, connecting to your Windows subsystem for Linux uh, distributions. Container remoting, which means logging into a container and working there. And SSH remoting, which means remoting into anything that you can SSH into pretty much. Now, for the recommended extensions, when I open my first folder here, uh, it opens up my code base and it will pick up on a file that's in there. It will in the bottom right show me this little notification saying this workspace has some recommendations. You can either immediately click install all or you can just first check out the recommendations. And you move to the extensions tab and it shows you well, for this code base, we recommend using these extensions. And you can install one of them, a couple of them, or click on the Install All button, and it will install all of them. So let me do that. It will install them. 
and they'll start popping in here. So we have the Docker extension right here, the to do tree extension, and a couple of extensions which work in the background. So you don't see any icons for those. Uh, the downside to this is who, who says any developer is either going to see the notification or click any of the install buttons. So this, this does not guarantee everybody's using the same workspace. So in the dev container demo, we'll see how we can do this better. But first, let's check out containers for the dependencies of the application. So I'll move to my containers demo. And I'll switch back to my presentation for a second. So since my demo application is using a Redis cache and a MongoDB server, those need to be running somewhere for me to be able to develop against it. And we want them to be running locally so we can just pick up our laptop, even if we don't have an internet connection, start everything up and start coding. Uh, the thing is, if you have another application on your machine which uses a SQL server and another application which uses another database server, uh, within no time you'll have your machine filled up with all kinds of servers which are probably running all the time and you want to prevent that. So what we can do using containers is we can use prepackaged containers uh, provided by, for example, the Redis team to start instances of those, uh, uh, of those uh, services for us and stop them very easily. So what I've done is I've installed the Docker extension in my Visual Studio code, and it shows me everything that's running on my machine. Now, at this point, there's no containers running, but you can see there are images on my machine. So I already have downloaded these images, which are like the blueprints for containers to uh, be started from. It's like a class versus an object in, pro uh, in object oriented programming. So using a simple command like this, I can tell the system, hey, Docker, run my container based on the Redis image. And also let me access this port, which is the default Redis port from my machine. So I can run this command and we'll see it happen. And then here in my containers tab, you can see there's now a Redis machine running. Now, first off, I'll start to, to prove to you that it's actually my application running here. I will start my application by doing run start without debugging. And let's wait for that a second. And we'll see that it won't work because now the database is not running yet. So let me drag it over here. Oh, let me take just this tab, there we go. We'll wait for my application to start. It will call into Redis, which it will be able to connect to now, but there won't be any data there. So it will connect to MongoDB, and that's not there, so it will fail. Now, first, let my application start up, which takes a couple of seconds. And hopefully, it doesn't break. But we'll get there. Now, in the meantime, I can show you that the image I'm using, the Redis and the MongoDB image, uh, I got those from Docker Hub. So that's hub.docker.com. It's like the NuGet repository, but this is for Docker images. If I type in MongoDB in the search bar, we'll find the official image for MongoDB. And if I click on that, it will give me information about the image, how I can get it locally, all kinds of information about the versions, and also usually, some commands to get started with it. So I use those and I change them up a little bit for this demo. Now my application is running now. So this is just uh, one of the templates provided by .NET, uh, ASP.NET Core for me. And I've added one view here, which tries to get some data from the server and show it here. Now at this point it fails because the server is not running yet. So if I switch back to my editor and I run the second command here, go to my Terminal and run this command. MongoDB container spins up as well. Here it is. And if I go back to my browser, we can see, oh, I was fast enough. So the data is already there. Now, what you can see is the data is now loaded. It came from MongoDB the first time. And now since I called it again, it's been retrieved from the cache. And if I empty the cache and reload again, you can see it's now coming from the sub from the database indicated by the loaded from cache flag. Reload again, now it's coming from Redis. So all systems are up and running. 
and I can work. So that means if a developer comes in, he clones his repository, he runs these two commands, he's good to go, which is already a step in the right direction. Now, let me go back to my container tab and run the stop commands. So stop in Redis, stop in Mongo. My system's clean again. There's no resources being used by these servers. And then the next time you want to work on this code base, you run the commands again. Uh, this is a way to go and it's actually doable, but imagine a system which has uh, 10 systems it needs to talk to. That would mean a whole lot of uh, terminal commands to run in the morning. And who's to say you don't make any mistakes there. So there's a better way to do this. And that's Docker Compose. So I'll show you that. Switch my editor. Here we go. So the difference here is that when we check the commands I just had in my text file, there's only two commands now. There's an up command and there's a down command. And there's a new Docker Compose file, which contains the information Docker needs to uh, make everything work. So in this case, I'm saying I want a Mongo service based on the Mongo image, and I want to expose this port to my local machine. And for Redis, I want a Redis image, and I want to expose this port. So it's pretty much the same information as before, just in a different way. Uh, the big uh, up for this is that this is all under source control, so it can be peer reviewed and it can go through pull request reviews and stuff like that. So using the commands, your developer comes in in the morning, he has his repository cloned, he has Docker installed, and he runs one command. Let me switch to my Docker tab right here. Say up. Thinks about it a little bit, and here's two containers running. And now my application can do its thing again. Imagine if this uh, were 10 services we needed, it's very uh, much easier to maintain this file than to keep running all kinds of terminal commands. Because it doesn't matter how many services you need here, it's always just the up and the down command. So let me use the down command to spin it all down again. And once it's done, Everything is gone. There we go, no containers left, no resources being used. So this is actually something you could tell your developers to do, right? Open up a repository, run this command, everything is up, do your work, and once you're done, close the repository, and run this command to bring everything back down. Okay, so now let's try to put those things together. So I'll move to my next uh, demo, for which I'll open another window. I'll come up in a second. And before I do that, I should do one thing. Close this window. I should uninstall the extensions that were recommended before. Let me go to my recommended extensions and just install these, uninstall these. So uninstall everything. There we go. And I can close this window and open up the other one. So now we should be back in the situation where we only have the remote extensions installed and nothing is in our local machine. Now, here we go. We're now going to check out dev containers. So um, first, let me move back to the slides and show you one thing. Normally, what you would do when you use a container is you would uh, package up your build artifacts from your applications. So build artifacts from .NET Core, uh, the results of .NET uh, publish, the, the, JS, the J JavaScript files and the HTML files and the CSS files for your Angular application. Combine them with the .NET Core runtime in this case, put it all in the package, which becomes a, a Docker image, and you can then give that to run on your local machine, run on uh, Azure container instances, run on a Kubernetes cluster, wherever you want to run the, uh, the container. But now we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to package up the SDK itself. We're going to package up Node.js for our Angular development. And then using Visual Studio code, we can also package up the extensions. So that gives us one complete development environment in a Docker container. I'll show you how this is set up. So first off, you'll notice there's no longer an extensions.json file here. Oh, I didn't show that before. That's fine. Uh, let's just move on to the dev container. So this consists of a Docker file, 
which is the file uh, based on which Docker will create an image for you. This one starts with a .NET Core SDK image, and you can select a specific version of that. In this case, version 3.1 has been selected for us. A whole lot of stuff happens here, and I'll show you one or two things. There's an option to install Node.js. There's an option to choose a version of Node.js, which for now is the latest LTS version. And there's an option to install the Azure CLI. So based on these settings, stuff will be available inside the dev environment. The next file we'll check out is the Docker Compose file, which for the, for the services we had before is pretty much the same. We need a Mongo image, we need a Redis image, or container rather. And then there's a new service, which is the dev service, which points to the Docker file. So it's going to use that uh, to run the, the container. And we're passing in some values for the arguments we just checked out. So we're still using 3.1, we're installing Node, latest LTS version, we're not installing the Azure CLI, and we're not installing any packages. Now, the last part of this is the devcontainer.json file, which is what Visual Studio Code will pick up on. Uh, that points to the Docker Compose file, so that links this linking it all together. It points to the service the Visual Studio Code editor needs to log into once the containers are up and running. This dev key maps to the dev service right here. And it indicates where in the container the code will be, in this case, slash workspace. Now also, the list of extensions is put in the devcontainer.json file, which means the system now knows about what it needs when developing in this code base. And since this is all next to the code, um, it knows that it, this belongs to this code base. Uh, the last thing we have to do is forward some ports because like before we had to forward the ports for uh, the Redis port and the MongoDB port. In this case, we have to forward the ports that .NET will host the application on. So that's ports 5000 for HTTP and 5001 for HTTPS. Now, when I opened this repository, there was a notification in the bottom right asking me, do you want to open this in a dev container? And I ignored that one. So I could show you this. So when I open the command palette with uh, F1, and because I have the remote containers extension installed, I can now do some options from remote containers. So there's three of them. One is open a folder in a container. I'll show you that next. One is add development container configuration files, which means uh, scaffold out these files. So if I click this, it will ask me, okay, what kind of project are you working on? And if I say .NET Core, I will get files really similar to the, what's, what's here right now. And rebuild and reopen container does first rebuild the container image that you have to do when you change the dev container JSON file or the Docker file. And then it opens the container and the same process that will happen here will start uh, to work. And what it does is when you open a foldering container and I'll click it so it can start doing its work. First, it will check if based on this dev container JSON file and this Docker file, it has an image that it can start up. If it doesn't, it builds the image, and then it starts the container. And when the container is running, it, uh, Visual Studio Code logs into the container and gives you access. Well, I've already pre-built this image. So the building of this image takes like maybe three minutes or something like that, and then it's ready. And once it's there, uh, Docker can just start up a new container from that image. So that's what it's doing right now. You're seeing stuff in the bottom right corner, starting with the dev container, installing extensions, which is important. And then in a couple of seconds, we'll have it up and running. Now check the left, the left bar where the extensions are not yet there. And now when we log into the container, my Docker extension pops in, my to-do tree extension pops in, and we check the extensions right here. We have our list of locally installed extensions, which is still the remote stuff, which was there before. And then let's click this one away. In our dev container, we have C-sharp, Docker, Prettier, and all the stuff that was in the list. Um, if we check our Docker extension here, we can see that it has already started everything it needs to be able to develop. So this is the container we're logged into right now. And then there's the database and the cache. So if I start this application up, we're going to run without debugging. And we'll wait for this. Uh, it will just work. 
So this is really powerful because now you can just give your developer uh, these three tools. So you need Docker Desktop, you need Visual Studio Code, you need that one plugin, and you tell them, clone this repository, open it up, and when it asks you, do you want to open this in a container, you just click yes, and everything starts working for you. You have all your dependencies met and all your resources running. Now, it's starting up. So I'll close the previous one down. And if it doesn't take too long, let me slide this down a bit. Ah, there we go. So it's loading. Here's the application. Go to the car view again. We see the data from the database. We see it's not coming from the cache. When we reload, it is coming from cache. So everything in the background is working as well. This is in private of a public preview at this point. So there's one thing that's not working yet. And that's if you stop and close your remote connection, the three containers that are running right now are not shut down yet. And that's what you want because otherwise everything is still running in the background, even when you're not working on your code base. But this will be fixed uh, soon. Uh, now, there's one more thing uh, you might wonder, and that's, well, this Docker file asks you which version of Node do you want. And in this case, it says the latest LTS. And this image is being built on your local machine. So what happens if developer A, who started a month ago, uh, built the image at that point? He has some version of Node.js, uh, some LTS version installed. And then developer B comes in tomorrow, runs the same process, but there is a new LTS version of Node.js in the meantime. So his image has another version. That's Drift for you already. So how can you fix that? Well, you can actually move the building of the container image out of this repository. And let me close this one down and open up the next one. Here we go. And then I'll show you the last one, which is this one. So what I did here is just like the MongoDB image and the, uh, let me try that, and the Redis image, I put the dev container image uh, up on Docker Hub. I can show you that right here. I'll go to my profile. And here we can see the image. So I've pushed it up there. And now it's available, since this is public, this is available for everyone to use. So in my repository, there's no longer a Docker file. There's just a dev container JSON and a Docker Compose file. And all of the build information is gone here, and it just points to an image. So that means when somebody starts this dev machine or this dev environment, it will just take this image and go with it. Now, there is ways to specify specific versions of this. For now, it just takes the latest version always. Uh, I'm not going to start this one up right now because it will do the same thing as, this, as the last demo. OK. so. Your extensions are in the dev container. Your external dependencies, like services and stuff you need to talk to, are in the dev container. You can get, your image is somewhere in a public repository, for example, Docker Hub. So you can now tell your developer, install the three things, open the repository, click open in, uh, open in uh, dev container. Docker will download the images if they're not on his machine yet, and then it will just start, and it will be able to go to work. So to me, that sounds like a really big win uh, in terms of time, because installing those three things, Docker for desktop, Visual Studio, and one extension should take you less than an hour. Um, so there you go. You're working. Now, there's one more step. We are always working on these beefy developer laptops uh, with lots of processing power. And the question is, do we really need to? Well, maybe in the future we don't, because Microsoft has now opened up Visual Studio Code Spaces for public preview. This is combined with Visual Studio Code and coming to Visual Studio 2019 uh, as well. And here we can see I've already spun up a dev container in Code Spaces from the same image I used before. So if I open this, it will spin up my environment. I made sure it was already running, so this is nice and fast. Normally, it could take like a minute or something like that. It will log in there. 
This will give me a Visual Studio code in the browser. It will give me all my extensions, including the GitHub extension and the LiveShare extension, which are provided by the CodeSpaces system. It will give me access to my code. It will give me access to my containers now running in a little cluster in the cloud. And it will let me start my application. And then behind the scenes, Microsoft is doing all kinds of port forwarding and networking magic to make sure I can just connect to it through my browser. So let's see that. Here we are in the application. We can go to the cars view. Since I did that before, it's already in cache. So empty the cache, reload. This is coming from the database. And if I reload again, it's coming from the cache again. So now you can imagine some developer coming onto the project and you just gave him, giving him a code space and saying, go, do your thing. That's actually pretty awesome. Now to create these is very simple. First, you have to create a code space plan because they have to know where to bill you because it doesn't, it isn't free. So create a plan, choose a subscription and choose a location and you're set to go. There's some advanced options here like choosing a resource group, giving it another name and choosing a default instance type, which I will show you now. I already have a plan, so I won't create one. If I choose to create a code space, it will ask me for a name. It will ask me for a Git repository and it will ask me for what kind of machine do I want? And I can change this after the fact. So it's even a simple system, like a medium system or a really beefy system, and these are priced accordingly. Then it will ask me, how long do you want me to wait before I shut down automatically? That means if you set it to five minutes and I don't do anything for five minutes, it spins down all the containers and I'm not paying anymore. So it's like a pay by the five minute system. And it even lets me have a separate repository of dot files. So that would be, for example, editor config files or Pretty RC files. And it can load those from a remote repository into my system and make those active as well. Um, this is not a difficult thing to do because I go if I go to my GitHub page, is where I host the code I'm showing you right now. So if I go to one of these branches, all I have to do is copy this URL, paste it in here, give it a name, and click Create. And then what happens is Visual Studio Code starts up again, the browser version, and it will now build the images, start the containers, and I'm ready to go. Now, the final thing I want to show you is that even using Visual Studio, your local version, using the remote extension, I can choose my code space targets. And this one's up and running, so I'll choose that one. I'll connect to it. And after a little bit of loading, I'll have the exact same experience as I had in the browser, but now I can just use Visual Studio proper. I'll have my extensions here. I'll have my access to the containers, which are running in the cloud right here. I can start the application, debug it. I can do everything I want. So now my own machine doesn't even have to do anything anymore. It's just a, a pass-through window or just a text editor. And every, pro every bit of processing is happening in the cloud. So that's an even more exciting proposition, I guess. So I'll close this connection. I'll move back to my slides. And let me go back a little bit here. So spending a lot of time setting up your development machine is no longer necessary. You can do this in the cloud, but you can also do it, also do it locally if uh, your assignment doesn't allow you to work in the cloud. Uh, reconfiguring when switching between projects, well, just open another dev container and you have your completely configured little system ready for you. Close it down, everything will, re will be removed again. Uh, find out why stuff that was working last week isn't working anymore. Well, unless you broke something, uh, the system should be the same. And configuration drift should be should no longer be an issue because everything everybody's working with the same set of extensions to get everything um, aligned. So that was my demo. I hope you liked it. Uh, my stuff is public, and I will 
give all the URLs to Xiaoqi so uh, we can share them with you as well uh, if you want to fiddle around with them. And with that, back to you, Xiaoqi. Wow, awesome stuff. Really cool. Yeah, I really like that code. And also the uh, setting to um, disable the uh, server after an amount of time, a certain amount of time. Because I had a lot of... Um, I had a lot of incidents that I came back from a weekend and logged into my Azure portal, my dev environment, and a very expensive machine was still running. So this is a very, very good add-on. Yeah, we maybe it's bef before an amount of money. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions. One is from Y. Conan, also known as Wouter de Bruin. He asked if, is this Docker setup something we can use to do automated tests without mocking everything? Yeah, I suppose so. Uh, the setup I showed you, and especially the uh, Docker Compose file, was really basic. Uh, but you can configure a lot of stuff in there. So you can even imagine uh, having one uh, branch of your repository, which is set up a little bit differently, but which also loads all kinds of uh, testing data into the MongoDB database or whatever database you're using. And then just starting that, running your tests, uh, and uh, putting the test report somewhere, and then spinning everything down again. Yes, it, it absolutely is. OK, cool. We have another question, a question from me. What is the best solution, hosting the image in Docker Hub or having it on your local machine? What, should, what would you recommend? Well, to get started, of course, do it on your local machine so you can uh, while you're building it out, you can rebuild really easily. And then once uh, you have something that your teams are working with, I would uh, suggest putting it in Docker Hub and also publishing it to Docker Hub from some kind of CI CD pipeline. Okay. Yeah. Sounds logical. Okay. So, yeah, that's it for the questions. So, okay. thank, you. thank you very much for this awesome presentation and thank enjoy you. the rest of your okay. holiday. Thanks, okay. I will. Bye-bye.